some of you may have noticed, as you stepped into the sanctuary this morning, that there were some snakes <laughs> lurking about. Well, why are there snakes in the sanctuary, you might ask? Well, it's a great question. Well, it's because today we are focusing in on the second book of the Harry Potter series, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Now, as you may have guessed by the snakes, um, you, you may have inferred that the snakes are a part of this story in Harry Potter. Harry Potter is in his second year at Hogwarts, and he encounters knowledge about what is called the Chamber of Secrets. And so most of the story is him trying to uncover what this Chamber of Secrets is. And someone is apparently trying to open the Chamber of Secrets to release a monster. Um, Harry Potter, Ron, and Hermione, his uh, two best friends, go on a search to um, defeat uh, individuals who are out to do harm in the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, and they uncover that this monster is a serpent, a special serpent called a basilisk. Now, the basilisk is a mythical creature that, if it looks upon you, it will kill you. If you happen to look at it through glass or a mirror, not directly, but if you happen to look at it indirectly, it will petrify you. It will turn you uh, into stone. And uh, in the Hogwarts uh, uh, infirmary, one of the nurses uh, works with the herbologist to create a concoction that will unpetrify and make you whole again and alive. Well, Harry Potter uncovers that uh, this uh, individual, Tom Riddle, a student at the school, is the one who is trying to open the Chamber of Secrets. Now, Tom Riddle, it gets kind of complex. Tom Riddle lived 50 years before Harry Potter. And so Tom Riddle uh, is somewhat of a ghost who has come back through a magical object, a journal. And Harry Potter uncovers, this is a spoiler alert for those of you who may not have read the books, uh, Harry Potter uncovers that Tom Riddle is actually the person who then becomes Voldemort, the person who killed Harry's parents. Now, this ghost of Tom Riddle lives in this diary, and Harry Potter has to figure out how to destroy this diary to defeat the ghost of Tom Riddle. And in the process, he comes face to face with this basilisk, this serpent. Another oddity of Harry is that he discovers he can speak snake. It's a very rare thing. Not a lot of wizards in the wizarding world can do that. And so a lot of the wizards are afraid of Harry because he can speak parcel tongue. Uh, Harry uses this, ironically, to engage the serpent, the basilisk, to find a way into the Chamber of Secrets and to eventually overcome uh, Tom Riddle. The thing that frightened Harry was that because he knew that he could speak snake, it made him different. It made him a lot more like Tom Riddle. It made him a lot more like Voldemort. It made him a lot more like Salazar Slytherin, one of the founders of the Hogwarts school. And those three people were kind of bad characters. Slytherin wanted to get rid of uh, impure wizards, and Tom Riddle was not a very good student and eventually became Voldemort. So Tom finds, or Harry Potter finds himself in some bad company by speaking snake. Well, he uh, is attacked by the snake in the very final scenes of this book, and he uh, is stabbed by the snake's poison venom uh, tooth. And he takes the tooth out and stabs the journal, thereby defeating Tom Riddle, overcoming this monster of the serpent, and uh, ends up saving some people that are very near and dear to his life. 
In our scriptures this morning, we encounter something similar about serpents. It's a really unique story in the uh, book of Numbers, where Moses has finally led his people out into the wilderness. And in Lent, we talk a lot about being led out into the wilderness. Well, Moses has brought them to freedom, but the Israelites are not happy, and they're complaining. They're pretty grumpy about it. And so uh, God hears the complaints, and so sends serpents out into the wilderness. And the serpents start biting the Israelites, and the Israelites start dying. Well, the Israelites realized that they were, this was happening because they were angry at God for freeing them and leading them out into the wilderness. So they go back to Moses and ask, will you please take care of this, Moses? So Moses constructs a bronze statue of a serpent, a poisonous snake, just as God had told Moses to do. And Moses instructs the Israelites that if they are bitten by a poisonous snake, to look at this bronze statue of a poisonous snake, and this will stop them from dying. It's rather interesting to me that the thing that the Israelites most feared, God turned into the thing that saved the Israelites. The thing that Harry most feared about himself, that he could speak snake and and thus, he was becoming one of the bad characters, was actually the thing that saved him in the end. When I was a little boy, I uh, loved to go out to the woods and catch snakes. And uh, we lived out in uh, the southern part of Colorado, and we had a pond in our backyard where there were some water snakes. And we'd go with a bucket, and my brothers and I would collect them. And one day, uh, typically the snakes would stay outside of the house down by the pond. My mother wouldn't allow them in the house. Right? Good idea. Well, one day, um, my brothers and I um, thought, well, why don't we bring some snakes back? Then we don't have to go back out to the pond and collect more snakes. We'll just take them to the house. So we took them into the house, and for lack of thinking of a better place to put these snakes, brought this bucket, five-gallon bucket of serpents, and put it in the basement, and then forgot about it. <laughs> well, my mother went down to the basement one day, and we heard uh, screams and shrieks uh, that there were slithering serpents in the basement. Well, all of us stayed out of the basement for um, some time. <laughs> After a while, though, um, we kind of forgot about it, and got over our fear, and went down to the basement, and lo and behold, after some time, the snakes were no more. Um, just some skeletons of snakes in the basement. Nothing really to be afraid of. They had gone away. Some things that are scary in life, however, aren't so little. I think we have our own snakes in our own lives that can petrify us, can cause us to freeze up, become stoned because we're so afraid, we're so bitten by that thing that we fear the most. I'm sure you might have an example in your life where you can think of something that brings you deep fear, that makes you freeze up, unable to move, unable to think, unable to move forward. When I was a, a student, an intern at, in college uh, at seminary, I worked um, for a boss that I didn't get along with very well, and he and I butted heads very often. And it got to the point where I was frustrated and upset with him, and, and I didn't want to see him or talk to him. And so when I would clock in at work, I would kind of lurk through the hallways to try and avoid this supervisor, knowing that I could get my work done in my office, clock out, and slip out the back door. You see, I'd become afraid of confronting this persona, this person that I had become afraid of. I'd become petrified that I suddenly wasn't doing the quality work that I was supposed to be doing. Well, thankfully, I had people in my life who helped me understand what was going on and helped me uncover what was happening for me. You see, as a 
in the scope of my work, I was having conflict with this supervisor. He and I didn't agree, and there were several opportunities where we got to yelling at each other and we had an argument. I discovered that I was afraid of arguing. I didn't like it very much. It was conflict. And I, I'm not a big fan of conflict. At least I wasn't back then. And I discovered that I was upset about the conflict with this individual because it reminded me of the conflict that I had with my parents as a young child. My parents were arguing a lot, not all the time, but enough that it scared me as a little boy, and I would go and hide in my closet. And I would shut the door and hide under a pile of clothes because I just didn't know what was going on. I was afraid. I was petrified. And see, later in life, because I hadn't addressed this fear, I was still afraid of it as an adult. And it affected my work and it affected my relationships. It almost got me fired. So one day I went to this supervisor and I confronted him and I addressed him and I went head in first into that conflict. I went directly towards that which I feared most. And I told him, I am so sorry that I have been avoiding you, but I don't know how to deal with this conflict. No one ever taught me what it means to do to have a healthy relationship with someone, to speak truth to be co-workers and yet not agree on the same issue. I don't know how to do this and I need help. And he was like, oh, so that has been what has going, been going on. I didn't know that you were struggling. I thought you were just being rude to me and angry and upset, and I was. <laughs> very rude and angry and upset. But I was so ashamed that I didn't know, that I didn't have the answers, that I wasn't making good choices. And I was so afraid of asking for help, I wanted to just cower in my office and shut the door like as a little boy I had cowered in my closet under a pile of clothes. You see, addressing that thing that I had feared most and walking straight head on into it, enabled me to become alive again. It taught me that I can have conflict in my life and argue with adults and, and still come out on the other end okay. I can live. I think this is something that we see in the Harry Potter books. Harry has to overcome these things that make him afraid. His fear of becoming like the person who murdered his parents. He doesn't want to be Voldemort. He doesn't want to be Tom Riddle. He didn't want to be in the Slytherin house. And he's fighting against that. And at the very end of the book, wise old Dumbledore says to Harry, it is not our abilities that is what matters, Harry. It is our choices. And yes, we might freeze up and be afraid and be petrified at moments, but we must seek the courage to make good choices in this life, to be honest, to seek out that goodness, to face our fears. And that is what moves us forward. You see, this is also what happens for Jesus in our scripture today. Uh, Jesus is talking with a man, Nicodemus, who is questioning Jesus about some matters of spiritual health and healing and wholeness. Nicodemus is curious. He wants to know what the secret is to life, everlasting life. And Jesus goes into this discussion about how one must be born again. Now talk about some scriptures that we might be afraid of. Something that we're uncomfortable with. Being born again. John 3.16 For God so loved the world. Some of these things that we kind of get uncomfortable with as more progressive Christians, more liberal-minded Christians. But let us look more deeply into what Jesus is talking about, to head directly into those scripture passages to understand them more fully. You see, being born again from heaven is about our own spiritual healing. It's about coming out of the closet 
and then facing our fears. It's about stepping out of the office and not lurking through the hallways, afraid of what is out there. But it's standing directly in front of that which petrifies us and telling it, I'm afraid, but God's love and grace is bigger than that. God tells me to not be afraid, and so I stand here before you, not unafraid and willing to walk forward in God's grace. I think that is food for the Spirit. That is healing for the Spirit. That is being born again in the Spirit, that we might be free to live a life unafraid. And so when Jesus says that God gave God's only so that we might have everlasting life, Jesus is talking about something very deep and profound. The thing that we are all afraid of as human beings, which is death itself. We fear death. We are crushed when a loved one passes away. It is the serpent's venom that strikes at our very hearts. It can petrify us. It can poison our lives. It's death. And so here is Jesus who walks directly into death. The very heart of the gospel. He walks directly into death and he dies. He does this to prove that death does not have the last word. He does this to prove that death does not overcome. He proves that this is how the Spirit is born, by walking directly into that which we fear most and going on to the other side. For we are people that do not believe that Christ remains dead, but that Christ has been resurrected and lives again. That we may understand that for ourselves is a spiritual matter. That no matter what the snakes in our own past may be, which have bitten us and poisoned us and petrified us, that we may seek to stand before those very serpents and find healing. This is the mystery of God that transforms us from those who fear death to those who are alive in Christ. And when we think about Jesus and what Jesus has done, we are reminded of that power. To go deeply into those places of fear and anxiety and wretchedness and understand that facing it head on, getting help for it, is what ultimately frees us. It is God's good grace in our lives that brings us happiness and holiness. No snake will ever bite you and petrify you again. And to this I say, Amen. amen. Let us continue by saying,